it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Welcome, I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we're gonna start a series on gospel foundations. This channel was at originally started so that I could lay out a systematic kingdom theology so that I could send to uh, friends and people that I know when they had questions about different issues of theology. Um, now, when I say a systematic kingdom theology, a kingdom theology, I mean, it's a practical theology that can be lived out in our lives. And in fact, one that if it's not lived out, doesn't count for anything. It's a disciples theology, and it's one that is gospel-centered and kingdom-focused, and I wanted to be systematic. Now, I kind of did some of this in the series on how to interpret the Old Testament and the different uh, ways of interpreting the scripture. When I talked about Calvinism and Hebraic roots and a few different things. Uh, also, uh, when we were talking about the law of Christ, that's part of the series, but that's way down the line. That's in the middle of the series. And so we're going to go ahead and start right at the beginning and uh, just go step by step, God willing, through this systematic theology. Um, I'm probably going to only make a video a week from now on for the foreseeable future. The things in Indonesia, the ministry here in Indonesia is getting busier, which is a good thing, praise God. And then also the channel, the Indonesian channel, I make a couple videos. I've been making three videos a week. I'm gonna go down to two videos a week. And even making two videos in Indonesian is a lot more difficult for me than making, you know, even, uh, you know, uh, five in English, just because I have to edit them. I have to edit down because my Indonesian is kind of, uh, in Chinese, we'd say Luan Chi Zhao means it's kind of here and there. And so I have to edit out the parts that are not quite understandable. And so it takes more time, but I'm gonna go ahead and just keep using this channel to kind of lay out the case for a systematic kingdom theology. And we're gonna start with the question, what is the gospel or how to summarize the gospel? Now, if we were in the same room and we were having uh, you know, a discussion about these things, I would ask, you know, what is the summary of the gospel? And so a lot of times people in evangelical circles, the answer will be something like, Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven and have eternal life. All those things are true. Jesus did die on the cross. He did die on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven and so that we could have eternal life. But that is not the core of the core of the gospel. Even though it is in certainly a, a main aspect of the gospel, it's not the very central message of the gospel. And we can see that laid out for us if we go to Acts chapter 2 and we see the first time that the gospel was publicly proclaimed after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we read through Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost and we find something very interesting in it. If I were to ask you where in the sermon does he mention the death of Jesus Christ, we would read it in verse 23. You have taken him who was handed over to you by the ordained counsel and foreknowledge of God and by lawless hands have crucified and killed him, whom God raised up by loosening the pool of death. Now, what we'll note by this is that in reading this, he doesn't tell us why Jesus died. He doesn't tell us that Jesus died for our sins so that we could be forgiven. He doesn't say that he died for sins at all. He just says that you, you wicked men, you killed him. You killed him, you put him to death, but God raised him from the dead. And so we see that Peter only mentions the death of Christ primarily in this message because he wanted to emphasize that Jesus was risen from the dead. And so we need to understand that the very core and central point of the gospel is that Jesus is risen. But it goes even more if we look at the summary of what uh, 
Peter says here in verse 36. After preaching his message, he sums it up in this way. Therefore, let all the house of Israel assuredly know that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So we see that he talks about the, res the death of Christ so that he can emphasize the resurrection of Christ. And then he talks about the resurrection of Christ it, so that he can say that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified and whom he raised from the dead, has made him Lord and Christ. And so if we wanted to sum up the gospel, we would sum it up with Jesus is Lord. Now let's go ahead and turn to, I've kind of given away the my normal punchline, but if we go over to Romans chapter 10, what I'll often do when trying to teach this subject is I will tell somebody to tell me where, I'll give a test, whether it's a congregation or to people that I'm teaching, I'll say, where in the Bible does it say this and ask and see if they can guess what verse this is in the Bible. And I read to them, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Savior and believe in your heart that he died on the cross for our sins, you will be saved. And usually at that point, some people are like, oh, I think it's in Romans. And maybe some like, oh, Romans chapter 10 for sure. And, and almost no one, when I bring that test up to bear, will say, wait a second, that Bible verse is not anywhere in the Bible. Because it's not. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say uh, in this phrase, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Savior and believe in your heart that he died for our sins, you'll be saved. Instead, what the verse says is, if you, uh, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so we need to see that there is a different emphasis than what we are used to. We are used to thinking in terms of the gospel, in terms of our salvation. We first, the first thought that we think of, it's good news. It's the gospel is good news and it's good news because we are going to hell and we're not going to hell now. We were enemies of God and now we're friends of God and we're forgiven. We're the children of God and we've got eternal life. It's not primarily good news because we're saved through believing it. The primary, the, the main thing about why it's good is because God has now set his son on the throne. That God has a son and his son is now Lord of all king of heaven and of earth, that he is the heir of all things and that he is Lord. That is the good news. Just like if we look back in history in the time when this was written, when, when it says Jesus is Lord, what was supposed to be said is Caesar is Lord because it's in the time of the Roman Empire. And in fact, Paul is writing in this book, he's writing to the Romans. They know exactly what they should be saying, but people were dying and bearing witness of Christ saying that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, but Jesus. And oftentimes when the, the term gospel was going out, it was to proclaim that Caesar now has a son. When there was a birth of a new son, the birth of a new, uh, you know, the emperor had a son, they would say, this is good news. And they would proclaim that the emperor now has an heir. He now has a son. And so when we proclaim that Jesus is Lord, we are proclaiming the good news. And that's good news, whether we believe it and it receive eternal life or whether we reject it and go to hell, it is still good news. It is good news from God's perspective and from God's kingdom perspective that his son is now seated on the throne. And this is the main thing that we want to get in this video today is that we understand that the gospel is not primarily about us. It is about Jesus Christ first and foremost. This is why if we turn back to, uh, if we go to Mark chapter 1, and we read what it was that Jesus preached. We go to Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. It says, After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So he is preaching the good news of God's kingdom. The saying, excuse me, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So what is at hand? Or, or what, it, what time is fulfilled? The time is, that is fulfilled is now that the kingdom of God is coming to earth. The kingdom of God is coming on, on earth. That's the good news. So repent and believe the gospel. What gospel? That the kingdom of God is here. That the kingdom of God has now drawn near. That is the good news that we should believe. And so why should we repent? Because the kingdom of God is near. Because he is now coming to rule and to reign. And since he is coming to rule and reign, we better repent and make sure that we are in line with him. Because he is the one that has the power to lift up one and to bring down another. And he is the judge of all the earth. And so we should submit to him. We should submit to God. We should repent. And we should believe the good news that the kingdom of God has come. 
And so this is one gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God. But if we jump up to verse 1, we read about a different gospel. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So is this indeed a different gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom of God? No, it's not, because what does it mean, the gospel of Jesus Christ? What does Jesus Christ mean? Jesus Christ means Jesus, that is the Savior, the Lord saves, and then it says Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the king. So we're basically saying Jesus the king, the son of God, the heir of all things. That is the good news. So the good news of the gospel or the good news of the kingdom is that God's son, the king, has now come. And he's come to save us because he is the Lord, our savior. The Lord saves, Jesus. So... Mm -hmm. We see here that it's not two different gospels, but it's two aspects of the one gospel. And the emphasis is not on us. Even though it says Jesus, meaning Yeshua, the Lord saves, that's not emphasizing only to us because it's he is the king, he is the son of God, and the good news is that the kingdom of God has come. And we see it as we go and we read on. Many people will think, well, the deity of Christ is only mentioned, you know, in the Gospel of John, but it starts off very clearly in Matthew's or Mark's Gospel. In the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, look, I am sending my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that John the Baptist came. But what did John the Baptist come to do? He came to preach repentance and prepare people and prepare the way of the Lord. And so Jesus Christ, this is a passage that was written about Yahweh. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and he has come and this is the good news that God's only son, his eternal word has become flesh and is now coming to dwell among us. And he is coming not only to dwell, but he is coming so that he can be made Lord, just as we saw in Acts chapter 2 verse 36. This is the goal or this is the main core of the gospel message, that Jesus is the king, that Jesus is Lord. So we understand that the good news, the good news that's preached, Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 24, he says that, and this good news of the kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all nations as a testimony and then the end shall come. So this gospel of the kingdom is the good news. So it's focused on the kingdom of God. But what does it, how does it relate to Jesus Christ? Because he is the king of God's kingdom. How can a man be a king of God's kingdom? Because this man is God's eternal son. And he has become man so that he can sit on the throne of God. And so the good news is that God has a son, he has an heir, and his kingdom has come. So does, how does this relate to our salvation or does it relate to our salvation? If we turn to Acts chapter 20 and start in verse 24, we read this. But none of these things deter me, this is Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders, but none of these things deter me, nor do I count my life of value to myself, so that I may joyfully finish my course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So here we see it's the gospel of the grace of God. So is this a completely different gospel? No, it's not, because as we read verse 25, now I know that all you among whom I went proclaiming the gospel of the grace of God, that's not what he says. He says, when I went proclaiming the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. So when he's talking about the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, he's talking about preaching the kingdom of God, proclaiming that Jesus is the king and that the kingdom of God has come in the Lord Jesus Christ. In you know, some of those in, you know, th things like the uh, mid-Acts dispensationalist group and some dispensationalists will say, look, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, but he didn't preach anything about the gospel of grace because the gospel of grace is that Jesus died for our sins and rose again according to the scriptures. And then if we believe that, we have eternal life. It doesn't have anything to do with repentance. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, living in holiness and submission to the king. It's only that we believe that Jesus died for our sins as an atonement. That is false and it's a misunderstanding of the gospel because when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what do you read about? What, what, is, what are those books about? They are about God becoming flesh, 
living and teaching his commands and his ways and then going to the cross and dying and then rising again and becoming king and being seated at the right hand of God and giving a commission to his people to go out and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded. That's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about. That's where they're called the four gospels because they are the message about Jesus Christ. And so the apostles were all preaching that message. But Jesus Christ himself was telling the apostles. Even though he hadn't died on the cross yet, he kept telling his disciples, even though they didn't understand it, that he was going to the cross and that he was going to become king and that his kingdom was going to come. They didn't understand. They were confused by it. But he was telling them. This is why in the middle of the gospels, you have them, uh, Jesus asking, well, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, God has revealed this to you. You are the Christ. You are the king. And when he went before, uh, you know, the, the rulers of Israel and he went before Pilate, what did he tell them? Yes, he is the king. He will be seated at the right hand of God from now on. That for this reason, he came into the world to be king and to testify to the truth. And so this is what the, the message that was being proclaimed, that the kingdom of God had come and that he was the king. He is the Christ. This is why if we believe that he is the Christ, what does it mean believe he is the Christ? We believe that he is the Lord, that he is the one that is risen, that he is the one that has been placed on the throne and that he is ruling over God's kingdom. If we believe in him, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, then we shall be saved. And so here, when it talks about the testify of the great, the gospel of the grace of God, and he went around proclaiming the kingdom of God, because by proclaiming the kingdom of God, he's proclaiming the king. And the king is the one that is going to judge the world on the day of judgment, but he's also the one that saves those who will be waiting for him patiently and faithfully, waiting in him, on him in hope until that day when he returns, then he will resurrect them from the dead and they will have eternal life. This is the gospel of the grace of God. It's the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus is the king and he has power to save and he has power to judge. And so it's a, it's a gospel of grace because through Jesus Christ going to the cross, through Jesus Christ rising from the dead and being seated at the right hand of God, he now has all authority in heaven and earth, including authority to forgive sins, to save to the uttermost all that come to God through him. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and we come to God through him. He is the one seated at the right hand of God and making intercession for those that call upon him. And so, on one day, we are going to see him at that throne of judgment and we're going to stand before the, the judgment seat of Christ. But right now, the judgment seat of Christ is a throne of grace and we can come daily and we can find grace and we can find mercy and help in time of need. And so we can come before him because he is the Christ. So there is no distinction between the, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom of God. No, because the gospel of the kingdom of God, who is the king? Jesus Christ is the king. What kind of king is he? He's a king that's going to judge his enemies that refuse to repent. And he's a king that will save those that will bow before him, submit to him, and place their trust in him. So we need to understand this message. If we flip back to Psalm chapter 2, we can see this written very clearly. Psalm chapter 2, we see the prophecy of... Uh, you, Today I have made you my son. We see this in, if I can find Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2 in verse, let's see, just start in verse 2. Uh, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, let us tear off their bonds and cast away their ropes from us. The people that don't want to submit to God or to his Christ, his anointed one, his king. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord ridicules them, then he he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his burning anger. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. So he's talking about setting the Christ, making him Lord, making him Christ, making him king. Verse 7, I will declare the decree of the Lord. Now this is Christ speaking. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations, your inheritance and the ends of your, the earth, your possession. You will break them with a scepter like iron and you will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. He was given all authority in heaven and on earth. Verse 10, now then you kings be wise, be admonished you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, tremble with trepidation. Kiss the son, that means bow before him in homage, lest he become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath kindles in a flash. Whose wrath is this? This is the wrath of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. If you've seen him, you've seen the father and he is filled with wrath towards rebellion. But 
Blessed are all who seek refuge in him. If we turn in repentance, as we repent, and we place our trust in the king and we submit to him, we shall be saved. We take refuge in him. This is the gospel of the kingdom. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the gospel of grace if we will turn to him. Now let's go ahead and look through a few more passages just to make sure that this is clearly what is being uh, taught. We'll see it more as we go through this, uh, you know, this endlessly long series. We'll see it as we go through it uh, in, in the epistles. But right now, let's look at it here in the book of Acts. If we go to Acts chapter 8 and we read about, let's see here, Acts chapter 8, uh, whenever uh, Philip is going to preach in Samaria, so it says in verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached the Christ to them. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miracles which he did, they listened in unity to what he said. So notice that the, the miracles were given as signs and wonders to draw attention to the word of God. So if somebody is doing signs and wonders and they are not preaching the word of God, then there's really no point to it. They need to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom to people and the preaching and proclaiming Christ to them so that they can turn their attention to that. On the other hand, those that would say that, no, we just have the word, we just go preach the word. Yes, but the gifts and the miracles are what draw attention to the word. And so miracles and signs and wonders can't save anyone, but they sure can get the attention of many. And in fact, they get the attention of the whole city so that they pay close attention to what was being said by Philip. And so we see if we jump over to verse 9, we see that there was uh, a man, Simon the sorcerer, who was leading people astray with all of his miracles. But in verse 11, it says, they listened to him because for a long time he had astonished them by his sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And so what does it mean they were baptized? It means that they repented. Just like uh, Peter in Acts chapter 2, when they asked him, after he concluded his sermon, which was summarized with Jesus is Lord, it said, it, it, that was the end of his sermon. He dropped the mic at that point and said, it's over. I proclaim to you that Jesus is risen, that he is the king. Then when they heard this, they were stung in the heart, verse 37, Acts chapter 2. They were stung in the heart and said, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you are, shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. And so this is what was being proclaimed. It says that he was proclaiming the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Why those two things? Because the kingdom of God has come. That's the good news. How has it come? It's come through Jesus Christ, who was rejected by uh, his nation, who was hung up on a cross and received a crown of thorns, a plaque that said he is, this is the, this is the king of the Jews, and that he was lifted high, high and lifted up and he was the king. He became king on that cross. And then he was risen from the dead and he was made Lord of all. And so G Philip was preaching the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And they were baptized. What did this mean that they were baptized? It meant that they turned from the rebellion against God and they placed their trust in the the one who had died and is now risen. This is why when they went into baptism, they were proclaiming two things. One, they were saying, I'm turning from my sins, I'm dying to sin with Jesus Christ, and I'm rising to a new life. The second thing that they were saying is that I believe that Jesus died, and they were dying with him, and I believe that he rose again, and they were coming to life with him. So they were proclaiming their repentance, and they were proclaiming their faith through the act of baptism. So this is what was being proclaimed by Philip. He was preaching the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and people were responding. Those that responded to it were baptized. They were receiving the forgiveness of sins and they were receiving the spirit of God. We see if we jump over to, uh, let's see, Acts chapter 28. Now, Acts chapter 28, so this can be the last chapter because some will say, well, but yeah, that's what Philip preached, but that's not what Paul preached because Paul had a different dispensation and he taught different things. That's just not true. That's not what the Bible says. That's what a system and an error states. But if we look in Acts chapter 28, we talk, we see that the leaders, when he was went to Rome and he was put in under house arrest, when he was there, the, the Jews that lived in that region wanted to talk with him. They wanted to hear about the message he was preaching because they'd heard all kinds of rumors about it. So in verse 23, when they, this is the Jewish leaders, or the Jewish people, when they had arranged a day to be with him, many came to him at his residence from morning until evening. He explained solemnly and testified of the kingdom of God to them, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses 
and the prophets. So what did he proclaim? He solemnly testified the kingdom of God to them. He was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. What else did he proclaim? Persuading them concerning Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophet. He was proclaiming Jesus Christ, who he was, what was prophesied about him, that he is the Christ. He is the king in God's kingdom. And so we see that that's what he preached to the Jews, but what did he preach to everyone? Because later we see... Uh, after some believed and some didn't believe, then Paul gave them a warning. And then verse 28, it says, Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will hear it. So in verse 29, when he had said these words, the Jews departed and disputed greatly among themselves. Verse 30, Paul remained two whole years in his own rented house. He welcomed all who came to him. So this would be both Jews and Gentiles. When they came to him, what did he proclaim? Did he proclaim the same thing to both Jew and Gentile as we see in Romans chapter 1? It says that the gospel is the salvation, uh, uh, is the power of God to salvation for all who believe, both of Jew and Gentile. And so what is this gospel he preached? In the last verse of the book of Acts, verse 31, he says, Boldly and freely, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the primary gospel message of the gospel, that Jesus is Lord. This is the focus, that, that God's kingdom has come and that his son is seated on the throne. This is the center. This is the centerpiece of the gospel. This doesn't mean that we don't tell people that Jesus died on the cross for sins. It just means that even that is not the very core of the core. So if you wanted to summarize the gospel, you could say that, uh, you know, you could say that God's son, eternal son, became flesh that he lived a holy and godly life, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose from the dead, and he's seated at the right hand of God, has been made Lord of all, and that he's coming again one day to judge the living and the dead. And so all those that will repent and trust in Jesus Christ and walk with him will receive eternal life, but those that do not will be judged and be damned to all for all eternity to hell. That's the summary of the gospel. Or you could summarize the gospel as Paul did in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he said the summary of the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he was rose from, the, rose from the dead according to the scriptures, that he died and rose again. That's also a good summary of the gospel. That's what we see in the act of baptism itself. And so we can know that, uh, of course, Jesus' death and resurrection is included that and in that summary in, in 1 Corinthians 15, that he died for our sins according to the scriptures. And so we have no reason to exclude the fact that Jesus died for our sins. But what we want to see is that not only in Acts chapter 2, but throughout the entire book of Acts, any time the gospel was publicly proclaimed, there, at least in the summary that was given to us by Luke in the book of Acts, there was never a mention that Jesus died for our sins. It's never mentioned. So that doesn't mean that they didn't say it. It just means that whenever you know Luke was making his edits to be able to summarize what he wanted to say, he didn't feel it was necessary to include that Jesus died for our sins. He wanted to focus in on the fact that Jesus is the risen king because that is the core of the core of the gospel. Jesus is Lord. And so we need to understand that. And one of the important reasons we need to understand, this is why this is foundational, is because people that think that the gospel is Jesus died for the, on the cross for my sins so that if I believe, I'll be forgiven and have eternal life. And they think that is the gospel, that that's the whole summary of the gospel, that that's it in a nutshell and that there's nothing else to it and that that's the focus of it is our salvation through Jesus dying on the cross. Then a lot of those people then come to think that, that uh, discipleship and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ is optional. It's something that we kind of grow into, or maybe we never quite grow into it, but we're saved because we're saved through believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. But the biblical gospel is that Jesus is Lord, and there is no way to disconnect that Jesus is Lord from a life of trusting obedience and loving obedience to him. This is why Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And that on that day, many will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. You call me Lord, but you don't submit to me as Lord. And so he's going to reject them on that day because the gospel is summed up, Jesus is Lord. And not only for others, when we proclaim the gospel so that it's clear to them that when they are becoming Christian, they are renouncing their old life, they are denying themselves, they are taking up their cross, and they are following Jesus. That, that is what it is to become a Christian. Following Jesus means trusting Jesus. And trusting Jesus means following Jesus. You can't separate the two. Uh, here in... 
uh, on my, my street, there's a lot of chickens that run around. And so when I drive out, I see the chickens, you know, and they kind of scatter, but they also sometimes have little chicks. And so I can't see in front of my car and it's a narrow road and I've got to get by and so I've got to keep moving. But sometimes I see the chicks running around and I can't tell whether I'm going to hit them or not. But when I see the mother way over there, I know that the chicks are safe because I know that the chicks follow the mother wherever she goes. And the mother is wiser and she gets out of the way of my car and so they follow her wherever she goes. And we, those that follow the Lord Jesus Christ, are those that follow the Lamb wherever he goes. We trust in him. And because we trust in him, he leads us to eternal life. And we walk after him so that where he is, we will be also on that day. And so, uh, so in the same way that the chicks follow their mother because they trust him, we follow Jesus because we trust him. So to, to separate faith and to say that we believe some facts that Jesus died on the cross, this is not biblical. What we believe first and foremost is we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Why? To be made Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And when we put that focus, then when we proclaim the gospel to people, they will understand what they're getting into. They will understand that God has made his son Christ the anointed one. He set, his, set him on the throne and he's given him a, a scepter to rule over all the nations and that they would be wise to come and kiss the son lest his anger be flared up in a moment. But if they will seek refuge in him, if they will take refuge in him, they will be saved. This is the gospel of their salvation and it comes and it starts with the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ who is the Savior. And so in our own lives as well, we need to keep this in mind that we are trusting in the Lord. We're trusting in our master, in our king. We're not just trusting him to forgive our sins. We're trusting him to be Lord over our lives and to th destroy the power of sin day by day as he leads us in righteousness. And so we need to be very careful that we get the core of the gospel right. So again, I don't want to give the impression that we're saying that Oh, Jesus dying on the cross for our sins is not a, a core part of the gospel. No, indeed, it is a core part of the gospel. But there's something that's even more fundamental, that we need to start with that first. And we need to branch out from there, slowly expanding our understanding of the gospel. The first thing is Jesus. If we want to really summarize the gospel, it's one word, Jesus. If we want to summarize it again in three words, Jesus is Lord. If we want to, let's see how many words that would be, but maybe five words. Jesus is the risen Lord. And so we can keep expanding that Jesus is the risen Lord that was dead and is now alive. Jesus is the risen Lord that was dead and, and he died for our sins and is now alive. We can keep expanding it out, but we need to understand that it starts with Jesus Christ is Lord. And we place our trust in him as Lord, as Savior, as King, as Judge. We believe who he is. We trust in him and we follow after him. We follow the Lamb wherever he goes. So I hope this has been helpful to you. Again, as I mentioned, this is going to be the beginning of... Uh, kind of a Bible study that we're going to go through systematically to understand kingdom theology, to understand a practical theology uh, that must be worked out in our lives, that must be walked out, that we must submit to the king. And we're going to understand, uh, God willing, many different aspects of this. And it's going to be focused on the kingdom. It's going to be focused on the king and this gospel, which is centered on Jesus Christ, not on us. It's centered on his kingdom first before it's centered on our salvation. Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.